Everybody knows everything about Ralph because he's done so much for design for so long. He's explained so much to so many of us about so much. Um, on the other hand, he wasn't always quite so venerable, you know. Um, and at the age of only 17, he joined the Marines, and that was during the wartime. So he has this aggressive, pugnacious, combative side that you just didn't know about. In fact, you can see it still with him. <laughs> I think, actually, it's really lucky that he did learn to type, because otherwise he might still be fighting everybody. But instead, he's written all these thousands of books and magazines and articles and everything that has taught us so much. Um, but there was a period of his time when he was working as a consultant with Herman Miller, when he was forced by Eames to do a lot more work than he really wanted to do. And this caused him to be extremely sleepy. Um, in fact, <laughs> It pretty much tired him out. Um, however, um, this enormous array of work is evidence that he did more than just sleep. Please welcome Ralph Kaplan. Thank you, Bill. I guess. <laughs> well, there, <coughs> there aren't any... Um, there aren't any pictures there of the, uh, the time I spent in uh, radio school. And so there's nothing high tech about this presentation. Um, and usually there, there isn't with me, except I've always envied people who have laptops and, uh, and look at them while they're talking. And so, uh, I, I put some of my notes on flash drive to see if that works and borrowed Bill's laptop. And if, um, and if it doesn't work or I can't do it, I'll uh, go to paper or, uh, or memory. Have you all had flu shots? <laughs> Well, I had one yesterday, and the technician who gave it to me um, you know, was conversational. And I said, uh, is this really necessary? And he said, oh, yeah, you, everybody has to do it. Um, and when I left, he said, uh, you know, you really ought to tell anybody you see who's over <laughs> six months old uh, that they ought to have flu shots. But I forgot till now. So you're the first ones I've, <laughs> I've given this advice to. Now you'll notice, um, the, I, sh I should explain that there's nothing wrong with the uh, projection facilities here. They're in perfect uh, working order. The screen uh, behind me will remain empty while I'm speaking. And afterwards, as far as I know, This is sometimes an annoyance when I, when I speak to designers. I'm, I'm asked for my visual. And the, um, the first time this happened, uh, long ago, I, I didn't know what they meant. And uh, finally, I said, visuals. Uh, I don't even have any actuals. <laughs> Maybe I could come up with a virtual or two. Um, but when I reply that I don't have any, they say, but these are designers. Uh, they're, they're visual people. And I say, yeah, I know that. Uh, it's because they're visual people that I don't need PowerPoint. I don't need slides. Designers can see pictures in their heads. It's their clients who need slides. Well, even if they buy that argument, they still shake their heads. Um, and, um, you know, clearly uh, they doubt my credentials for talking to designers about design. Uh, you may be wondering the same thing. At times I've wondered myself, but a couple of weeks ago I realized what a really strong position I'm in. You know, recently, uh, 
a couple of weeks ago, we had the primary elections. And uh, now the winners are campaigning for the general election. And uh, you can't avoid them unless you uh, don't watch television, don't read newspapers, and don't get on the internet. Uh, so you're confronted all the time with, uh, with political news. And did you ever notice that the candidates from both parties, every candidate is an outsider. That's, that's what they all say they are. I mean, people have been in Congress for 30 years insist uh, they couldn't even find Washington on a map. Uh, the, the GPS is set so that if a car ever turns toward the District of Columbia, a stern feminine voice from the dashboard will say, recalculating. <laughs> uh, plainly, they go, well, the message is clear. If you want to be trusted, the best thing you can possibly be is an outsider. Well, I'm the quintessential outsider. Uh, I'm not a designer. I have no design training, no engineering background. I never went to art school. What more authority do I need? You, you can believe everything I say. You know, Bill Moggridge uh, started and ran the uh, one of the most effective uh, design offices in the world. What does he know? Um, today, uh, or recently, I, I read that today design is considered necessary and not just fluff. Um, I don't know where I read it. I um, have looked through a couple of weeks' worth of papers, and I can't find it. But it makes no difference. Anyone might have said it. And uh, almost at any time, with varying measures of conviction, as the, um, as the millennium approached, a designer I know called me up and said, uh, I hope you've noticed that now clients are calling us in at the very beginning instead of the end. And I said, well, I, uh, what I've noticed is that designers have been claiming that as long as I can remember. <laughs> and he said, well, well, maybe, but now it's true. Well, today it's, it is true. It's even truer. And uh, that's important because what we need designer for, designers for is what happens when a project is conceived before the substantive decisions have been made. And that matters more today than uh, it ever has before. It's later than we thought. For most of my non-designing life, I've been interested in the extension of the design process beyond artifacts to the situations in which they're used. And um, clearly, we're moving in that direction now. That hasn't always been the case. I, I used to complain that, uh, that, that what was wrong with designers was that most of them spent their splendid energies and talents doing things that really did not represent the most important human considerations or important things at all. This was not a surprising state of affairs, really. In the, um, in the 30s, American designers um, were credited with moving the country out of the Depression by making products better, or, or better, at least better looking, and thereby leading consumers to buy them. Well, getting out of the Depression wasn't that, that simple. Um, look at how hard it is to get even out of a recession now. Um, design didn't do it, but design helped. And consequently, it was seen from that time on for a long time, if it was seen at all, as the handmaiden to industry. But only the handmaiden, 
uh, My, Michael Beirut reminded me recently that I, I once described designers as exotic menials. Menial because their services are required for uh, what are regarded as low-level jobs, jobs performed after the real decisions have been made. But exotic because no one understands what the hell they do, including their mothers. Uh, that, that was initially the status of design. But even at the time, even when professional design was brand new, many designers lamented that narrow view of their role. And they resisted it. When, when Henry Dreyfus was 30 years old and broke, Macy's offered him a lucrative job reviewing products that weren't selling well. They wanted him to look over the ones that weren't moving and draw improved versions of them. He declined. He declined on the grounds that the only way to improve products was to work with the factories that made them. Similarly, when uh, Walter Norwin Teague, another design pioneer, was asked to redesign Kodak cameras, <clears throat> he insisted on doing it where and when they were made. Uh, but even at that, these experiences had to do with uh, relatively limited opportunities. Many designers uh, knew that the design process was appropriate for far more. And the more thoughtful ones worried about whether they were getting equal to the task. In the 60s, uh, my friend Dick Latham, who uh, at the time headed the uh, very prominent large Chicago firm Latham Tyler Jensen, said plaintively, we do the nothing to get their attention. Once we get it, if we get it, then what do we do? Well, I think the, uh, the exhibition upstairs is a late answer of sorts to that, uh, that question. You know, it's, um, the function of a museum has changed so radically it, it, just in my lifetime, it, it would not too long ago have been impossible to imagine a museum exhibition with the word now in its title. Museums were not about now. They were about then. They were repositories of the past. I don't know where mummies go to die, but museums were where they went to prove that they had. <laughs> I mean, the human race, um, in effect, said, uh, been there, done that. And a museum was where you went to see specimens of what had been done. But the, sal the salient feature of um, this exhibition, I think, is the indication of how far design has come. It shows the, um, the trajectory of design so far. The, the more serious approaches to, uh, to these subjects, to sustainability, to universal design, to ecological sensitivity, things like this used to come mainly from students and teachers. You know, re remember when green was just the color and not yet a cliche in corporate mission statements? Well, long before design, uh, long before we had decent, fast, comfortable wheelchairs and reasonably functioning prosthetics, concerns about such matters were fairly common assignments in design schools. But if they were ever presented to corporations, they were uh, dismissed as blue sky idealism. 
Well, last, uh, you know, the, the people with managers would tell uh, young designers and their, and their teachers, uh, you know, you, you've got to get into the real world. You know, we can't use idealistic blue sky designs. Well, now they are the real world. They, uh, they have to be, and people know it. Uh, last year, the, uh, the indefatigable uh, Alan Chachinov uh, had the audacity to assign a prosthetics problem to a class he was teaching. Uh, you know, design an artificial arm. Well, there was nothing audacious about that in itself. As I said, that kind of thing had been going on in design schools for a long time. The audacity lay in the fact that it was a class of graphic designers. I mean, how about that at, at the School of Visual Arts? Graphic designers uh, traditionally work in two dimensions, right? Arms and legs and bodies uh, normally are three-dimensional. But the students understood that the, uh, the problem was not to design an arm or a leg, but to confront the situations faced by people who had lost arms and legs, or who never had them in the first place. The design of uh, situations uh, has been the unhidden agenda in my work for a very long time, expressed in the, uh, the subtitle of my book, By Design, Why There Are No Locks on the bathroom doors of the Hotel Louis XIV and other object lessons. Well, the object lesson was that the problem to be solved was not an object, not at all. It was a situation, in this case, keeping hotel guests from denying each other access to shared bathrooms. I admit there are, there are loftier examples of situation design. Um, when we speak of the design of uh, our war strategy, or call someone the architect of American foreign <clears throat> policy, the, these are not merely figures of speech. Foreign policies do have architecture. Wars are fought on the basis of strategic designs. One, one of the most trenchant essays I know is a uh, brief gem by George Nelson with the provocative title, How to Kill People, A Problem of Design. Well, George sometimes took on a kind of amused and amusing cynicism. Uh, he argued that we know from history that the activity human beings value most is killing each other. And wars are won by countries with the best designers, the best designers of uh, guns, tanks, and bombs, just as uh, they were previously won by the best designers of bows and arrows and slingshots. Um, he didn't live to see drones. Now, to emphasize the design of situations does not diminish the value of objects, as demonstrated in, in this museum's incredible collection, or the talent and taste that the collection represents. Um, fabrics, uh, prints, bird cages. Got a terrific uh, collection of bird cages. I, I don't know uh, 
if birds ever see it. But the stuff is, is great. The stuff is wonderful. And the, the collection came first. There was a Cooper Hewitt collection before there was a Cooper Hewitt Museum. However, from its inception as the National Museum of Design, this has been a museum of process and not just of things and materials. That was as spectacularly true of the opening exhibition in 1976, Man Transforms, as it is in this year's Triennale exhibition with the, uh, the more gender neutral title, Why Design Now? You know, there's something challenging um, and um, maybe even irritating uh, about an exhibition with a question for a title. Because immediately, it raises questions about the question. Is it rhetorical? Or does it require an answer? If it's rhetorical, is it answered by the exhibition itself? I'd say yes, but not, not, as, not as clearly as, my, as we might wish. If we're meant to answer it, even more questions come up. Is, is design here a verb or a noun? Does the title of the exhibition mean, why should we design now? Or does it mean, why do we have design now? Why is there design? Um, critics were quick to see that the uh, exhibition showed design in a new light. And several writers, uh, if you look at the, uh, the reviews, you see several writers compared it favorably to the ICFF held last spring at the Javits Center. Uh, how many of you saw that? I can't see your hands anyway, start. <laughs> I'd say seven. <laughs> Alyssa Walker, uh, writing in Good Magazine, uh, was deeply distressed by the number of chairs at the ICFF. It seemed uh, just a travesty to her that, uh, that there'd be so many chairs given so much prominence. She, uh, she seems not to have realized that ICFF stands for International Contemporary Furniture Fair. So the inclusion of uh, chairs is not that outrageous. Um, but really, she writes indignantly, does the future of design lie in a $6,000 sofa section? She goes on to say, in the last 10 years, the Cooper Hewitt's exhibition has departed from the chair worship downtown, evolving from a US-only furniture and gadgets fest to an extremely wide international survey of projects, products, and concepts that achieve goals far loftier than sales figures. It now includes projects that range from foundation-fueled grants led by hulking NGOs to self-initiated campaigns by designers working at their kitchen tables. It addresses issues from energy to mobility to healthcare. There are also a few chairs. Well, in fact, uh, the chairs are, are there for a special reason, as you've seen if you've seen the show. But uh, there ought to be chairs. One of the, um, this museum's first public programs was a symposium on chairs that, um, uh, that grew into a book called Chair. Um, but we can all understand the writer's irritation. Do, do we need another chair? Really? I mean, some cultures don't have them at all. And in their absence, um, people can sit on damn near anything. Curbs, 
the guards around tree wells, logs, grass, their own haunches, or uh, for yogis who have mastered levitation, uh, nothing much at all. <laughs> a, chair, uh, a chair really is the first thing you need when you don't need anything. And yet, our most celebrated designers have taken them very seriously, haven't they? Um, who's designed chairs? Charles and Ray Eames, Euro Saarinen, Harry Bertoia, Bernard Pantone, <coughs> Werner Pantone, Frank Lloyd Wright, Niels Different, Bill Stumpf, Mies van der Rohe, Robert, Vent Robert Venturi, Gio Ponti, Castiglione, Frank Gehry, and as I learned Tuesday evening from uh, a comprehensive lecture by Steve Heller, um, the graphic designer Alvin Lustig. The technical criteria for uh, designing chairs are sometimes complex. They have to do with joining, bonding, welding. But the performance criteria, at least for the residential market, and pretty much for the uh, office market too, the, the performance criteria for chairs are pretty simple. They're the same ones Goldilocks use. <laughs> too hard, too soft, just right. Uh, the design critic, um, Kerry Jacobs, writing in Metropolis magazine, um, had a very different take on the exhibition, arguing that it is too virtuous, too self-righteous, too environmentally responsible too sober at the expense of the pleasure that we have a right to expect from design. I couldn't help thinking, she writes, that the pendulum has swung too hard, too fast. A design exhibit needs eye candy to throw the serious stuff into relief. Kerry Jacobs is a, a very astute writer. And if she finds an exhibition lacking in pleasure, there, there's pretty good reason to ask, how come? Has the, uh, the subject become too serious to allow for fun? Or have the issues become so urgent that we need new ways to communicate them, to ways to somehow balance sobriety and high seriousness with levity. The moment I can't think of anyone but John Stewart who knows how to do that. Um, how would you lighten so heavy a message? Uh, I've tried to think about it. Once a, um, a designer <clears throat> brought a uh, solar electric chair to Aspen, Colorado, where, where it would collect plenty of sun. Um, and I, I loved the product because it, it promised to achieve the most reprehensible goal you can imagine, taking human life, by the most unassailably virtuous means. You know, if you were sufficiently patient, it would take, I guess, 500,000 years. You could execute someone while shrinking the carbon footprint. <coughs> I mean, talk about efficiency. Um, I don't think the pendulum has swung too hard. In, in fact, I don't think the pendulum is a useful metaphor for, for design generally. It's true that the design history uh, has seen a lot of pendular motion. Uh, Gothic architecture um, gave way to Renaissance architecture. Modernism got rid of all the cockamamie frills you, you didn't need. And postmodernism set about putting it all back. Uh, Mies said, less is more. And Robert Venturi said, less is a bore. 
uh, yeah, there have been pendulums. But a, a pendulum describes too narrow an arc for our purposes. It, um, it, it offers too little action. It, you know, all it can do is go back and forth, which doesn't get you anywhere at the requisite speed, not the speed we need now. For contemporary urgencies, we need more room to move around in, room to expand the design process with other disciplines. Why design now? You know, last week, there was an all-day conference on that very subject. I was only able to attend half. So if a definitive answer was revealed at the end, I, I didn't hear it. <laughs> it may come down to something the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas once said. You know, Tom, Thomas <clears throat> never showed the slightest signs of uh, conventional religiosity. And he was asked why why he nevertheless still believed in God. Why, he replied. Why? Because I'd be a damn fool if I didn't. Thank you. We should open the conversation to people who are here. Um, so I hope you'll be going to be thinking about comments and questions you'd like to um, bring to the table. But could, just could before- Could we consider opening the conversation to people who aren't here? Well, it that- might, It might be safer. Would be, is, it'll be a one-way only system. We are streaming live, but, uh, but we, can't, we can't get much feedback. Oh, you tell me, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, that conference, by the way, um, you know, was we had this huge deluge in the morning, which caused a lot of the trains to be cancelled, and so a few less people were able to actually come than we hoped. Um, um, although there were 280 people there, which is a pretty good number, but we had more than 2,000 people um, with the streaming, because it was streamed both on Core 77 and on our website. So that was nice. Um, no, we never answered the question. Had you expected to? No. <laughs> Um, I did a blog on it, actually, um, which I put up yesterday, but it was really, my response to it was interesting things, interesting ideas. I just liked some of the things that were said and were brought to the front. So, Before we ask for other people to join in, um, do you have a, a special chair, a favorite chair, a chair that you have a relationship with that's particular? I have two. Uh, the, um, the Eames lounge chair with Ottoman, six, uh, 670, what Herman Miller calls a 670, is uh, really my favorite chair. That's the one that made you tired, isn't it? Yeah, yes, that's what I, Well, uh, it's my favorite chair for everything but sitting. Um, uh, it's, uh, first of all, you know, Charles, um, Charles' idea of doing research was to uh, make a prototype and then sit in it. Well, uh, that guaranteed that it was a pretty good chair for anyone who's as tall as he is. Um, for me, it doesn't work, but it, it, it works in a way for almost anybody because it's so roomy. Uh, you can find some position, but my I have an old um, um, mahogany chair, I think, a rocker, uh, that um, somebody uh, gave me years ago. And, uh, and he had never used it and was going to throw it away. <clears throat> and I, I can sit in it you know, for hours and look at, uh, look at the Eames chair. <laughs> have, have the, both, the best of both worlds. 
Yeah, I suppose a lot of chairs are uh, for looking at, um, although some are for sitting. Um, but perhaps your point about designing for yourself is one of the um, major mistakes that designers always seem to have made, that they've always been selfish enough to think that they're the right size, rather than thinking of the person who's a lot smaller or a lot bigger or heavier or has a different attitude. And the idea of designing for other people is something that uh, we've sometimes failed to... Oh, yeah, I, I, I think all the time. But um, at, at that level, I mean, I mean if, you're, if you're designing something, it can't be uh, for a market of people who have bodies just like yours. Um, but they have something just like yours. I, uh, interesting, I asked uh, uh, Charles once, uh, <coughs> uh, a long time ago, I said, you know, it, it's funny, be, um, you know, you're considered a pretty, um, a pretty special designer. Um, you know, um, not a designer of the people so much. And he said, yeah, I guess we have that reputation. And I said, um, and uh, you design for yourself. And um, he said, yeah, I, I guess that's true. And I said, how come if you design for yourself, uh, these products sell so well? Why, why are they so popular? And uh, Charles gave me an answer that I think uh, is really important for all designers. He said, uh, you design for yourself. But if you're going to design for yourself, you've got to design deeply for, your, uh, for yourself. Because he said, if, if you design superficially, for yourself, then you're designing for your eccentricities. But if you're uh, if you're really designing deeply for yourself, you discover that lots of people just like you down there, and they respond to what you do. Find the truth. So, who's going to say something? Goodness me, come along. <laughs> yes. I want that person removed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just curious, how did you get started in writing about design? Or, I, I, don't, I don't know the story behind you know, how you got into writing about design. I'm going to have to repeat these um, so that we get it on the streaming. So he asks, uh, why, how did you get started writing about design? All right. Boy, that's a uh, that's a sign of a good moderator. To to remember that you have to repeat the question, because everybody behind him can't hear him. Um, well, it, there is a story, um, and it's a a long story. That, um, <clears throat> I was working for a humor magazine, and it folded. Um, <laughs> well. <laughs> That, that's that's not humor. Why is that so funny? That's supposed to be, uh, that's not supposed to be funny. I was out of a job. No. Uh, it, it, as a matter of fact, it wasn't a tragedy because uh, the humor magazine, uh, which was called Bounty, it wasn't a very funny magazine to read. It, it was a very funny magazine to work for. Uh, but uh, since it wasn't funny to read, uh, it didn't last many issues and it folded. And uh, I simply needed a job. And uh, the first one I found uh, was, the first one I heard about was a magazine called uh, Industrial Design, shortened even at the time to ID. And um, the editor was a woman named uh, Jane Mitaraki then, 
Uh, I've followed her through a series of other names since then. Uh, and Jane Thompson now. But anyway, um, I didn't, didn't know her, <coughs> never heard of her. But I've never heard of design either uh, <laughs> much. So uh, I was uh, interviewed. And Jane, uh, Jane said, um, what do you know about industrial design? And uh, I thought for a minute, not about how much I knew, because I, I was aware of that, but about what I should say. And finally, I said, absolutely nothing. Well, I, later I figured that she hired me uh, either because she thought anybody who would give that answer at a job interview um, has got to be so absolutely uh, honest and straight that you could trust them, or so utterly stupid you could manipulate them to do anything <laughs> uh, you wanted. In my case, it was probably both. Um, but that's how I started. And then I, I really didn't know anything about design. But then I discovered um, that there was this whole world of things I really had always been interested in and never knew. Uh, I, I never knew there was a profession made up of people who did this, or who could. Well, how wonderful that you and Jane have come together in the National Design Awards this year with her receiving the Lifetime Achievement and you that receiving really the Design Mind. Yeah, so, so, so you're, you're um, connected again, um, in spite of the fact that ID had a wake, um, which was just a few months ago with the last issue. Right. Yeah, it's too, it's too bad, but this is a this is a period when magazines have wakes. Although the online versions of them thrive, thank you, Alan. Yes. With Call Seventy Seven, etc. So yes. Quite a lot. There we go. What advice do you have for a graphic design student? She says, what advice do you have for graphic design students? <clears throat> Get in some other business. No. <laughs> uh, you think I have any? Um, well, I don't, uh, I think, um, you know, everybody worries um, about the end of print. Uh, I don't really think anybody worries about the, um, the end of graphic, graphic design as such. Um, you know, you still need it. Um, uh, just as you, one way or another, you still need writing. I, I, think, I, I think, though, my, if my advice to graphic design students, uh, if, I thought there were any naive enough to ask me for advice. Um, would be to um, be sure not to limit um, yourself to um, what graphic design has traditionally been. Because like everything else, it's changing and changing very fast, and including things uh, nobody would ever have thought of. Uh, this is advice really that everybody's following anyway. Um, but there are, there are so many more things uh, that you can do that than uh, were once uh, dreamed of, but nobody's sure what these are yet. So that's a challenge. I think it's interesting to think about the future of books, because it seems to me that um, as electronic books become more prevalent, um, the future of the printed book becomes a better opportunity for designers because why would you have a book at all that's physical unless it's a really wonderful experience and, and that the beauty of it and the richness of its illustrations and yeah. the, the feel of its pages and the smell of its ink and all those things that make books wonderful makes you want that experience. That has to be beautifully designed. Um, whereas if you just want the text, you might as well go to a Kindle or an iPad. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing. I was reading the, 
in the a bulletin of the uh, the Authors Guild, uh, which the new one just came out, and I was reading it today. And uh, the Authors Guild, unlike most professional organizations, um, gets really top uh, top writers to um, head it to do the administrative. Well, they don't do the administrative work, but. The uh, Roy Blunt Jr., has, who has been the president, uh, has finished his term. And the new one is uh, Scott, uh, Scott Thoreau, who, who's a wonderful writer. And, uh, and he, he wrote his first editorial on the, the question of whether, whether the, um, the existence of the Kindle uh, is good for writers. And uh, you know nobody is sure. It's good and bad. It's um, it's good because you know something has still has to be written. It's bad because um, uh, the uh, the e-books sell for so much less that authors' uh, royalties suffer. So look over that. What do you see for the future of design museums? What do you see for the future of design museums? Mm -hmm. What kind of role do you think play? Well, well, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, more and more, Diane, I think it's, um, <clears throat> it's an instructional, even an interpretive role. Yeah, I, I, I mean, um, you know, I'm, I was being dead serious when I say I didn't know anything about design when I started writing about it. But um, and one of the things I didn't know about it was that people did it. I, I mean, if you know, not everybody today realizes that stuff just doesn't appear. I mean, there are. Uh, uh, are people who uh, design it. Uh, you've suspected that for a long time. Uh, and um, museums, uh, I, I think, do a lot to, um, uh, to help explain that and help dramatize it and help uh, show what's going on and, uh, and who does it. And um, I, I think the role of museums uh, Grows as um, as the things that they uh, deal with grow. In this case, art. But I mean, in this case, design. But uh, art, culture, in uh, general. Um, I remember being so surprised when the Museum of Modern Art opened. Uh, I, I mean, I never thought there, there'd be a museum of modern anything. You know, I mean, when uh, when I when I was five or six, my parents took me to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, and uh, all I remember about it are mummies, which are pretty fascinating when you're uh, five or six. Um, I don't know what else they had, but they didn't have modern art. Um, well, it was Diane Pilgrim who asked that question, of course. She is a previous director of this very museum, so she's obviously thought very deeply about it. But thank you so much for thinking so deeply about our exhibition and including that in what you said this evening. That was wonderful, I thought. It's great to have a sort of analysis of the other con uh, the even comments though, that we've had. Even though I uh, quoted a critic who panned it? I think you need both sides, don't you? And, uh, you know, Carrie is always very thoughtful. Yes. What is good design for you? What is good design? for you? For, your what is good design for you? <laughs> well, one, one thing good design is for me is something I've studiously um, avoided talking about if I, <laughs> if I could. Well, because, you know, there's all this talk of believing in good design. Um, and for a long time, there were corporations, there still are, who, um, 
used to um, have slogans saying, we believe in good design. Well, we stand for good design. Well, does anybody believe in bad anything? <laughs> I, I mean, does anybody want bad food, bad sex? I mean, I mean it stands to reason that um, if, you, uh, <clears throat> if you want something, uh, you want it to be good. So the, I, I think it's, it's much more helpful if the emphasis really is not on what is good design, but what is design. If, um, you know, if you do it, somebody will tell you if it's good or not. Um, but people love bad design. I mean, they love to talk, identify bad design, don't they? I mean, I remember I was giving yeah. a talk at one of the computer human interaction conferences where you have 2,000 software people all in the same room. And uh, I showed an example of really bad design, and I got a standing ovation. I showed all these other examples of great design, and I, they never even clapped, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, bad, yeah, because bad design is, is funny, and it, and it gives you something you can feel superior to. Right? Look how tacky that is. Mm -hmm. um. um, a comment. Um, if I could continue that discussion about the Kindle, I think it's a good example of someone having studied the situation of how the reader reads, what they need while they're reading, like a definition, um, what they need to do after they've read the definition so the back button brings you right back to the text. To look up a word, you, you don't have to open a dictionary, you just put the cursor right next to the word and the definition pops up at the bottom. I, I think uh, it, it's really an example of, of uh, studying the situation of the reader. And uh, I mean, it has certain disadvantages because it doesn't seem to me that there are a lot of proofreaders involved because they scan the text in and there can be errors in letters and things like that. We, uh, I don't know where, where proofreading comes into play, but uh, I think they've really studied the, the how a reader reads in making that. I agree. I, I think that's... Uh, this that's was, by the way, an, an, an eloquent summary of the assets of the Kindle as an e-book experience for the reader. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it isn't enough. Um, the, uh, even though... You know, I, I put my notes um, on Bill's laptop um, because I've always wanted to do that. And I've, uh, <laughs> and I, I've, uh, I don't know what made me so confident that I could because I, and nothing made you confident. You kept telling me, oh, you've got to hold this. And <laughs> you, there's the cursor, remember that. And, um, Anyway, it seemed to work okay. I, I said, would you like a mouse? Yes, I, didn't. <clears throat> uh, I declined. But uh, as strange as it seems, um, I really, um, e even though I'm <clears throat> very inept with uh, a Mac um, or any other computer, I, uh, I was involved with computers very early. Um, in the um, in the 60s, um, about 1964, I think, I um, was a consultant. This is even harder to believe. I was a consultant to the Commission on College Physics, which I never had taken because I couldn't have passed it. <laughs> and we were we were trying to investigate. How, whether you could use computers in uh, in education, and uh, use them for a lot of things. That, uh, at that time, computers were um, well. Nobody had them. No, no person had them. Not even offices didn't have them. Uh, big institutions, and not many of them had them because they really filled rooms. But um, there were there were two guys from the uh, Lawrence Radiation Lab, um, Crowley and Stevens, I think. 
Anyway, they were experimenting with <clears throat> something they called computer animation. And uh, they spent one whole summer that we worked on this project um, proving that you could actually, with a computer program, in theory, get the figure of a woman, a stick figure of a woman, to walk across the screen. Well, you know, that was an enormous uh, breakthrough. But they, um, uh, Crowley used to tell me, um, you know, in, in time, you can have whole libraries on a computer. I don't think even he realized then uh, how small they'd be, but yeah, but you couldn't, you can't. He said, you don't need books. Um, he said, we can have all this on a computer. And um, <clears throat> I said, yeah, but I don't want that. Um, I, I said, <clears throat> I, I want a book. I want, um, well, as you said, Bill, the, the smell of the ink and the feel of the paper and um, the, uh, the nice thud you get when you close it because you're bored with it. Uh, mm -hmm. all, and the tactile sensation of just holding it and thumbing through it and, and browsing. And uh, Crowley said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, you want the teddy bear effect. He said, we can, the time will come when we can program that into it for you. And I said, yeah, but you know, I don't want the teddy bear effect. Uh, I want the goddamn teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's pretty hard to get from Kindle, I, I think. I'm sorry. Thank you, Bill. But I, I just want to add that in terms of writers, if you look at the blogs on Amazon about people talking about their experience of the Kindle, they're all saying that they're reading more and more. They're reading several books a week because they have it with them. They can choose between <clears throat> philosophy and, and, and children's books. And you know they can make their own categories of, uh, of their collections of books. And they're reading more. So that should be good for writers, uh, don't you think? Yeah. I, 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 writers should be happy that people are reading more due to e-books, particularly oh, right. Kindles. And, and in fact, uh, uh, Scott uh, Turo, in, in his first editorial as president of the Authors Guild, was asked, um, uh, do you own an e-book? And he said, well, I bought a Kindle once. But the uh, backlighting was so irritating that I, uh, I found I couldn't read it in bed, and I just uh, didn't use it. But he said, now somebody just gave me an iPad. And he said, I took it with me on a trip because um, I discovered that uh, I could put uh, eight travel books, uh, probably 28 travel books, uh, onto- 280. Uh, yeah, and, onto, uh, a Kindle, and I could also put all the the novels that I'd been uh, putting off reading because I didn't have time, and take them with me. And he said that that was very helpful. And um, also, he said I had the version of a Kindle that has a um, a voiceover option, so uh, when you're driving, it'll read to you. And he said that was just a big help. I think it's interesting when you come back to the graphic design question, what should I do as a graphic designer? Uh, if you think about the generation of content, the authorship, the writing, the illustration, whatever the content may be, then that seems to continue to expand. The opportunity continues to expand. But the opportunity we have as designers is to connect that to the medium. So as the book needs to become more book-like and rich, more richly book-like, the book designer has this lovely opportunity. But also, if you're designing for the iPad, it's going to be different from the book, because you can do those things, and you have to design for that. And indeed, the Kindle is different from the iPad, because the Kindle is reflective, and it has this page turn thing, whereas the iPad can see all sorts of moving images at 30 frames a second. So each medium has its opportunity for design, 
but it's sort of separated from the content. So I think as designers, perhaps we're interpreters of content into media. Well, I, yeah, at least that, but I think more. Uh, you know, a, a late answer to uh, the question about uh, what I would tell graphic designers is um, I would tell them, you know, you're, you've got a stake in content, um, not just because you're doing something that affects it, uh, but because you have a brain and a heart and emotions, and, and uh, you can be responsible for some of it. Um, and uh, for a long time, I, I, I guess this is still done, this, you know, people talked, uh, <clears throat> he's our content, our content man. He's somebody else, whatever. Um, I worked once uh, with a graphic designer in a magazine that I, uh, I won't name, but um, she drove me crazy because I kept trying, <clears throat> I wasn't, um, I wasn't writing much for it, I was a consultant, but I kept trying to uh, get her to see that there was no point in designing the magazine, designing an issue, until she knew what was in it and discussed it with the editor. Well, she said no. She wanted the editor to tell her what was going to be in it, and then she <laughs> would design it. And. Um, it's a, a weird kind of stubbornness, but uh, I think. Hmm. Alan asks um, about uh, Ralph's teaching experience and what it's like to be a critic and um, see a new generation of critics and designers and analysts coming forward and what it's like to be a teacher at uh, the School of Visual Arts. Yeah, <clears throat> well, um, one of the prize students is sitting in the front row. Uh, so you have to be nice. <laughs> the, um, well, the experience was very interesting because I, I, was, I began with absolute skepticism. Um, Stephen Heller, who um, was art director of the New York Times and is now in the head of graduate studies um, at the School of Visual Arts, and um, Alice Twemlow, who, who's a, a, a very fine design critic. Uh, she, she's, a, um, uh, she's a Brit, uh, like others uh, around here. Uh, but they, uh, they approached me with their plans, uh, described their plans for a, a graduate um, program in design criticism. And um, they were very enthusiastic about it. So I didn't exactly want to throw water on it. But uh, I, I said, just out of curiosity, what would make you think that there's anybody in the Western world who wants to get a graduate degree in design criticism? Well, they, uh, they insisted that there were lots of people. Well, I said, um, you know, and then the, the faculty that they had put together, uh, uh, Kurt Anderson and Carrie Jacobs and um, um, Akiko Bush, uh, just a, uh, uh, Julie Lasky, just a whole bunch of very good people. Um, and so I, <clears throat> I, I said, yeah, I'd be glad to teach you know, if, if you get students. Well, then, uh, then um, after a while, Alice sent the, uh, the resumes, really the write-ups. They were very personal uh, little essays on who they were from the students. And uh, my immediate response, my honest response was, uh, with with students uh, with students like this, uh, oh thank you. I was going to pour it on my knee. Which would... I'll pour it on your knee if you like. <laughs> no, your way's okay. Yeah, I, 
I, I know the British have their formal <coughs> techniques. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I thought with students like this, you know, who needs a faculty? Um, they, um, they were all experienced. Um, only one out of 16 had um, gone to design school and just graduated. The others had all worked in design, um, were still working in design, uh, and uh, just wanted to do something else and were interested in design criticism for a variety of reasons. Well, I thought, OK, that's, yeah, that's a lock. And then um, the following year, uh, and this is a class that includes uh, Kim here, uh, the same thing was true. Uh, the, uh, there, there were students who were absolutely uh, as, um, as, as well qualified, as, as overqualified as the first group. And um, I don't know what the secret is, but uh, somehow they got them. And, uh, uh, then, and, and all, they all came, you know, they didn't just come from uh, Pratt and Art Center. Uh, they came from, um, well, you went to Brown, right? Uh, they came from Princeton, Brown, one I think from MIT, uh, but liberal arts colleges, and also from all over. Uh, they, they weren't all American. So it's um, been for me a, a, a very enriching experience. But you know, I, um, the question is, once you've agreed to teach a course in design criticism, um, what the hell do you teach? And um, uh, Alice said, um, uh, you have to have a syllabus. And, um, I knew vaguely what a syllabus was, but I'd, <laughs> I'd never seen one and certainly never created one. Uh, and so I actually Googled, I Googled syllabus and, and <laughs> one. I didn't use the one I got, but, uh, <laughs> but I said, you mean I've, I've got to say what they're going to be doing every day? This is like the, you know, the French, um, grammar school system in the 19th century. Um, and she said, yeah, you've got, you've got to do that. So um, I did a syllabus. And then she said, you've, and now you've got to have a name for the course. So I named it the, uh, uh, the critical imperative. How, how's that for a grandiose, pompous <laughs> name? And um, I thought it sounded academic. Uh, and uh, and that if I was lucky, nobody would uh, ask what it meant. <laughs> nobody has, uh, I think. And anyway, the uh, oh, and then the, the syllabus. I did the students all get the syllabus, and so I did it because uh, she required it. But I. Um, at the top of it, I have a disclaimer uh, saying uh, the syllabus is largely a work of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ralph, for a wonderful evening and wonderful talk.